Hello, my name is Wendy Myers. Welcome to the Live to 110 podcast. You can find me on live to 110.com and you can find this video podcast on the YouTube channel at Wendy Live to 110 and on the corresponding blog post. Today we have Dr. Tina Christie on the podcast. She's going to be talking about genetics and methylation and a lot of interesting SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, like MTHFR and how those affect our health and can possibly lead to disease uh, because uh, genes are the gun, but our diet and lifestyle are the trigger. So we're going to talk about that today on the show. Please keep in mind that this program is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or health condition and is not a substitute for professional medical advice. Uh, please consult your healthcare practitioner before engaging in any treatment that we suggest today on the show. Uh, but so excited, my new online program, bodybiorehab.com, has launched. Go check it out, bodybiorehab.com. I talk about all the five pillars of health, all the ways that I think that you need to be engaging to get the health results that you seek. In this program, you're going to learn how to increase your energy, how to banish brain fog, how to lose 10 pounds in 30 days with my four-week meal plan. Lots of really interesting tidbits, tons of video. There's a video for every single module. So go check it out at bodybiorehab.com. Dr. Christie, Dr. Tina Christie, obtained a Bachelor Degree of Science in Biology and Chemistry from the University of Toronto and then went on to study naturopathic medicine at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine in Toronto. She's completed training in mind-body medicine at Harvard Medical School and the Bowen Technique. She has lectured for Nike Canada, the Heart and Stroke Foundation, the Brampton Fibromyalgia Group, the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine, and various probus groups, as well as giving private lectures to individual groups. Dr. Christy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Wendy. It's great to be here. Why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got into medicine? Um, yeah, so um, I've been practicing as a naturopathic doctor for the last 13 years. Um, but uh, as a kid, I wanted to go into conventional medicine ever since I was like five. You know, I wanted to go into conventional medicine. But uh, I was just, I was a sick kid. You know, I had all, all the... Uh, typical problems that you think of uh, when someone tunes into this kind of information. Now I know I had problems with dairy, with gluten, with my immune system, with my digestive system, skin. Like I, it was just, uh, I was tired all the time. It was kind of never ending. Um, and when I was 17, I got, I got sick with my stomach. I got gastritis, which is kind of like, it, it's not an ulcer, but an ulcer is a hole, but it's an irritation of your stomach lining. And I got really upset. Um, you know, I had, uh, I was 17 and I had a prescription painkiller for, um, you know, like some menstrual cramps that I had, um, and I didn't use them that much. And now I had a stomach pill too. So I had two prescriptions at 17 and I just thought this is, this is ridiculous. This is horrible. I'm only 17. Where am I going with this? And it was actually in that moment that I decided I was going to find something better and, uh, for myself. And then I thought, oh, well, because I, I was 17, so I was thinking about university at this point. And I thought, well, how could I go into medicine if uh, I'm not going to do this for myself? How could I make a living doing this for people? So I thought, great, whatever I find for myself, that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, as cliche as it sounds, I went to the public library, <laughs> public <laughs> library <laughs> in the, the city where I lived, which was much smaller than it is now, and took out a bunch of books on herbs and other random holistic things. And that's where it all started. Hmm. Well, let's talk about genetics. Uh, I yeah. want to delve into this, this uh, subject because so many of my clients are wanting genetic testing. And I was very fascinated when I finally got around to doing my genetic testing and all the implications that it can have for your health. So let's talk about genetic testing, what is it all about, and you know why bother testing if our genes can't be changed? Ah, but the way they express themselves can be changed. So the kinds of things they do or don't do can be changed. Um, so you could have a gene for, um, I don't know, a predisposition to kidney disease. And it never happens because you, you take care of that. So a, a big reason to test for it is because for 
For many people, there can be a lot of frustration and even mystery around certain symptoms that they're having or certain health challenges that they're having. And uh, without genetic testing, there, there can sometimes be a lot of guesswork. And in that guesswork process, things don't always go very well. People don't always get better. And that's when they feel like, oh, I go to see this person, I go to see that person. It helps a little or everything that they do with all of their other clients are doing with me, nothing's working. Um, or, you know, they're following great advice and, and, and things just aren't working out and they can't figure out what it, what it is. And then when you get that genetic information, sometimes it can just blow the doors wide open to this stuff and you have such a, a deeper understanding of what's going on with your body and the way your body is made. And you can, these genes can be worked around. Uh, in genetics, or genomics, there's a con the concept or the word term epigenetics and epigenetics means above the gene so it's like we have and just think of it like we can do things that are above the gene it's like they're higher than the gene or they have power if you want to call it that power over the gene because genes can be expressed or unexpressed so there's uh knowing what's going on uh, you know, there's a, one of the, the most, I guess, emotionally loaded examples of this, um, and I wasn't going to get into this example specifically, this gene isn't actually something I normally address with patients, but there's a gene that highly, highly correlates to Alzheimer's disease. I think if you have this gene, you're like 90% 90, 90 that, you're, that you're getting Alzheimer's. But if you take certain measures where you get around this gene, um, you're probably not going to get it till you're in your 90s uh, versus your 60s. Mm -hmm. You got to detox aluminum too. All, aluminum is a big factor in uh, Alzheimer's and other oh. forms of dementia. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so it, 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 the, the genetics themselves can't be changed. Um, and a great example is uh, genes, um, our genetics load the gun and environment pulls the trigger. Uh -huh. So the loaded gun can sit there and never go off. And that's the power that we can have. Um, we can't unload the gun, but it never needs to go off. Yeah, I was really surprised when I did my genetic testing. I found out I had a gene called FUT2. And um, I was very happy to learn, and I already knew it intuitively, that I needed more carbohydrates and less fat than a lot of paleo diets and, uh, you know, the... Uh, slow oxidizer diet and things like that that relate to hair mineral analysis that I need more carbs and fat than or less fat than than a lot of other people and I think that's why I'm not a big fan of hardcore paleo diets and why I developed my own version called modern paleo because everyone is so different and if you have this FUT2 gene it very much influences the kind of diet and the the macronutrients that you need to be eating yeah, and you know, that's one of the things that genetic testing really brings to light is our differences. Like the hardcore paleo people or the big vegan people or will have you believe that we're all the same, that there's we're we're human and there's one diet that works for everybody. Um or in one lifestyle that's gonna that's gonna work. And it's it's so untrue. And that's where a lot of people get, you know, really frustrated. Um I uh I don't need quite as many carbs and fat as yourself. But I need a lot less fat than the hardcore paleo. Like when I went hardcore paleo eating lots of fat, I blew up like a balloon. <laughs> it was horrible. Yeah. I'm like, but the avocado, how could the avocado and bacon make me fat? You know, they say it doesn't. Yeah, eat 70% fat. And that, that works for <laughs> very young males, uh, the young males that are touting the 70% fat. But doesn't quite work for everyone, especially uh, menopausal women or premenopausal. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's just not it, it's just not the same. And when you, uh, and I think it really helps a lot of people too to see the test results and go, ah, okay, yeah, that's just the way I'm made. And here versus, oh, there must be something wrong with me. This isn't working for me. What am I doing? Or um, oh yeah, I just get stressed out all the time. I'm so crazy. But meanwhile, maybe a higher um, propensity towards stress is in their genetics. So you still need to take care of that. Yeah. But 
you're not crazy. You're you're predisposed to this. Yeah. And that's that's how your body's made. Whereas someone else, maybe it's not. Yeah, I found for me, I had a BHMT. Uh, I had two alleles expressing for that. There's a few of the BHMT uh, SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, yeah. But uh, that's when you're kind of an internal stressor. <laughs> and I have a lot of clients that have this where you're just kind of like wound up inside. Um, but you can do lots of things like tapping, you know, uh, emotional freedom technique, EFT, and oh, bio yeah. biofeedback and other things like that to get around that. That's your workaround for that. Um, can you talk about some of the other genes that are, you know, popular that we should, you know, want to be looking for on a genetic test or a 23andMe.com test? Yeah, another great one, just because you mentioned um, you mentioned stress, is the um, 5-HTTLPR. It's a long name, and there's there's no short name for that one. Um, and there is the what they call the L. You can be LL, LS, or SS. And if you've got an S in there, people tend to stress much more and produce a lot more cortisol if you're the LS or the SS. But um, when, so this is the typical not chill, you know, not relaxed kind of person <laughs> tends to have a higher stress response. And you know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> um, and when those people with an S, the LS or the SS, meditated, they had a cortisol or a stress response just like the LL people who were the ones that don't have the big stress response. Yeah. Um, so that's actually a recent study. It just came out, I think, a few months ago. Yeah, there's lots, so, of, lots of research going on. It's, it's a, a new field, but we have a pretty good, pretty good grasp, I think, of uh, the, the genes that are currently on many genetic tests like 23andMe.com. But still, I think it's in its early infancy of, uh, of study and research. It definitely is. One thing I just want to caution your listeners with is getting a genetic test and interpreting it yourself because the genes aren't plug and play. Right? You can't say, well, I've got this gene, so I react this way, and I've got this. It, they tend to interact, and they all morph yeah. together. So, you know, if you get, if you do get a test done from one of the bigger, make sure you're, you know, I think it's important for people to make sure they're consulting with someone who also who has some expertise in the area, because it can get, um, it, it can, it can be a bit of a web. And get a little complicated. So um, just wanted to. Yeah, because I know there's some drink, some genes like the NAT2 uh, will cause you know promote you to have like weaker adrenals or maybe more pronounced adrenal fatigue, and that'll be even more pronounced. Do you have the COMPT uh, genetic SNP? Yeah, COMPT is actually one of my uh, one of my favorite <laughs> one of my favorite genes. Um, you know, it uh, if you've got a slow, you can have a slow, a normal, a slow, or a fast COMPT or COMT gene. And uh, that does a couple of things. It's actually involved in estrogen metabolism. So if that gene is slow, you won't metabolize estrogen as well. And, for, you know, for, so for women, you can uh, be predisposed to PMS um, or just, you know, other uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable period, like painful periods, uh, heavy periods, things like that. So your estrogen uh, really being out of whack. But it also, the COMT gene breaks down dopamine and it breaks down um, adrenaline and noradrenaline, or epinephrine and norepinephrine. So the, uh, the the adrenaline rush, you know, the adrenaline rush hormones. And when that breaks down slowly in people, um, these people have extra extra stimulation, you know. So they put out dopamine, which is the feel good hormone, um, and you know it's easy to put adrenaline too, especially with the uh, the pace of society today. And then um, if we're just looking at the COMT gene, there's, there's another factor in this that we can talk about in, in a sec. But if they're just looking at the COMT um, and you're breaking down dopamine, like a feel-good stimula stimulating hormone slowly, and you're breaking down adrenaline slowly, um, these people can uh, just get stimulated and wired and stay that way. Um, which is, you know, a drain on your adrenal glands, a drain on your system as a whole when you get excited and you're not able to just calm back down. You stay up there. Um, but the other one that that really interacts with is uh, something called DRD2. So, you know, the COMT breaks down dopamine, which is the feel-good feel neurotransmitter. 
I mean, serotonin is feel good from a life having joy and life having pleasure point of view. And dopamine is feel good from a motivational point of view. It stimulates the pleasure center of your brain, the same part of your brain that's stimulated by like MSG and cocaine and stuff. Yeah, so cigarettes. it's a real. Cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and so DRD2 is dopamine receptors. So how many places your dopamine has to bind. So someone could have, a, let's say, a slow COMT. So they're breaking dopamine down really slow, um, and they're breaking down adrenaline really slow as well, but they don't have um, a lot of dopamine receptors because the DRD2 gene for the receptors, it can have, be a low number, a moderate number, or a high number. So if you've got a lot of dopamine but not a lot of places for it to bind, it kind of mitigates the effect versus having a medium number of places for it to bind or a lot. Often when there's a lot of places for a lot of dopamine to, uh, to bind, you get a lot of, um, you get a lot of anxiety in people as well because these people are just so stimulated, all, uh, frequently very stimulated and have a lot of trouble calming down because they're not breaking down the dopamine and there's lots of places for it to go. Or when people uh, have a very fast COMT and they're breaking down dopamine and they're breaking down adrenaline really quickly. Um, especially if there's, let's say, not a lot of dopamine receptors or there's only a moderate amount, there can be a lot of depression because dopamine is energizing and motivating. Um, so these people can be prone to depression or drug addiction as they try to boost, as they're constantly trying to boost their dopamine. Um, or these people could have trouble um, learning from their mistakes. That's an interesting, an interesting psychological <laughs> one because they don't have the reward pathway. Um, for, you know, learning something and changing something and getting that shot of dopamine that like, yes, I did it. I did something different or that worked. Or, yeah, that's, you know, that, that, that reward pathway is dopamine. And if they're not getting that, it's just, it's not feeding back and they're not like, oh, whatever. Yeah. Versus the, yeah, that, that other of us, others of us might get. Yeah, and you know who you are. The, one, the ones yeah. that learn from your mistakes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I might be a little guilty of that, but. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I got a little too much, too much dopamine. I have a slow COMT, so I always have to to, to chill out. <laughs> you know, another gene I'm really interested in is the CYP one and two, and these yeah. are the genes that where if you have this, like I do, like many of my clients have, you have a reduced ability to metabolize estrogen, and mm. if you drink caffeine, if you're drinking, you know, two or more cups a day. And caffeine reduces the body's ability to metabolize estrogen. If you've got a fatty liver, reduced ability to metabolize estrogen. And this can lead to estrogen-dependent cancers, which are so rampant and prevalent yeah. in our society today. So I think it's important to know if you're expressing for that gene because, you know, you, you need to watch it. You need to, you know, fix your liver, clean your liver, maybe do a coffee on it here and there, and uh, reduce the caffeine, eliminate it or reduce it to that one cup a day. Yeah, and that's uh, and that's something important as well that you that you had mentioned um, or that you just said is that you know our genes are what they are, but then how are they being expressed? So you don't want to just test for that and go, oh, my estrogen's not being metabolized well clearly from my genetics, so I'm going to get estrogen cancer. You know, I mean, first of all, these these genes we can we can get around them, but um, doing testing to see where you're at um, is uh, is pretty important. Because depending on, you know, some of the other genes you have present, your environment, your stress level, how well you take care of yourself, you could be, um, you could be sitting on a sea of estrogen or it could not be, not be quite as bad. Um, but it can be, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's important, it's important to test for that. And, um, you know, with the detox enzymes, especially if the SIP, the SIP 1A2 is slow, um, or the CYP1A2 is fast, rather. A lot of people can have a, or some people can have a fast CYP1A2, and then the other, the, the CYP, uh, I think it's 2A1 and 3A4, uh, they're slower. And uh, so, you know, phase one, you know, the liver detox, you got phase one, phase two. If phase one's going fast and phase two's not keeping up, then you get the toxic intermediates, you know, between phase one and phase two, you get a backlog and that backlog is really damaging. It damages the DNA and, and stuff like that. Um, although the, the CYP1A2, you know, when estrogen goes down that first pathway, 
Um, it's a little, um, it's a less harmful pathway in terms of the estrogen breakdown products than some of the other ones, which go down um, more harmful estrogen pathways. So it's a real, um, I, I know uh, some genetic experts who call the hormonal pathways a, a sailing expedition. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's different every time. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a straight course; it's just a huge zigzag. You never zigzag. You never know what you're going to get. Um, and you know, and then Compt is involved in there as well. And in, in terms of the uh, estrogen, estrogen breaking down, you can it, it can produce a lot of free radicals um, and um, some free radicals and some other metabolic intermediates that can be really damaging to our DNA. Um, and the COMT enzyme can thwart some of that before it goes down and creates some of those really toxic metabolites. The COMT can take it down another pathway that's a little less harmful. Um, you know, there's something called the, the SOD, the superoxide dimutase, the gene that codes for that enzyme. That can quench some of those free radicals as well. Um, and, that's, and that's one of the reasons, especially if people are looking for hormonal stuff, in a uh, in a genetic panel it can really help to have a consultation with someone who knows what they're talking about before you just spin yourself around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are there any other genes that you really like that uh, you think the listeners should know about? Yeah, um, you know, one that's really interesting uh, is called ADRA2B. ADRA2B is a, um, I don't want to call it a trauma gene, but people who um, have um, one end of the ADRA 2B can just remember everything, every trauma. Um, uh, you know, you looked at me the wrong way 10 years ago type of person. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the people in the middle who they, um, they can let stuff go, but they can remember stuff too, but it's a little more balanced. They can have empathy, but they also don't necessarily um, and then it can ruminate a bit, so it's kind of in the middle. And then there's the people at the other end of the spectrum who nothing bothers them. Yeah, every day is a new um, day. They don't remember anything. No, no bad stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and these are the people that can actually sometimes lack empathy because they're like, "What's your problem?" Yeah, doesn't bother me. You know, so that's a that's a real funny gene, and especially the people who tend to hold on to stuff. Um, and can really struggle with that. And sometimes I, I think it can help to know, oh, okay, that's my genetics. So I need to, this is something that I need to address specifically or something that I need to be mindful of. Yeah. So ADRA2B is, uh, is an interesting one. Um, I also really like the uh, uh, NOS, NOS3. It's a nitric oxide synthase enzyme. Um, and this produces nitric oxide to uh, dilate our blood vessels, which especially comes out, you know, when we're exercising and doing cardiovascular exercise. And so some people, um, especially if that gene is, you know, it can be full on in the sense that, you know, you get maximum or optimal amounts of nitric oxide. It can be so-so or it can be where you're getting low amounts of nitric oxide. And if it's not optimal and you're getting lower amounts of nitric oxide, you need to watch the amount of cardiovascular exercise mm. you do because your blood vessels don't dilate as well. Mm. And so they can incur more damage and there's higher rates of card there can be higher rates of cardiovascular disease with intense cardio exercise. And that's another thing that can be like, you know, being paleo or vegan or eating bacon and avocados every day, being paleo, where a lot of the times with exercise, there's no um, one thing's right for everyone, you know? Be a marathon runner and do triathlons. It's great for you. And for some people, that's damaging. Yeah, I knew that from a very young age. I never went running. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not for me. Not my genetics. Good for you. Like yeah, you know what? Flamingo running or giraffe running. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. yeah, I could never do it either. I could never um, run. And when I do cardio, it, I can expand my capacity a bit and that these people can expand their capacity. But that kind of intense cardio or, you know, like two and three hours worth and stuff um, is just is just brutal. And usually those people know that they don't do well with it. But sometimes they might think, oh, maybe I'm just lazy or maybe I'm just too out of shape. Like, why can't I do that? And um, so that's 
that's a cool gene. Well, these are also the the people that purchase Viagra, correct? Because <laughs> Viagra increases nitric oxide, yeah. right? <laughs> I haven't seen that correlation, but I bet there should be a study for that. Well, that's what it does. It increases nitric oxide. So yeah. Your blood yeah. vessels can dilate. That's yeah, yeah. Do does, a genetic so. panel on all the yeah. Viagra buyers and see what their NOS3 is. <laughs> um, another one that I really, I really like is the ACE, the yeah. ACE enzyme. Um, and one of the reasons I, I find it particularly fascinating is because that was a real eye opener for me. Um, I've got the least desirable form of it myself. Um, so what the ACE enzyme does is these are the people who don't tolerate salt or who get tend to get swollen really easily when they eat salt. You know, their kidneys don't eliminate the salt well and the ACE system or the angiotensin converting enzyme system, which regulates blood pressure and how your um, kidneys are clearing sodium and things like that. Um, that system tends to be overactive and their kidneys keep excess sodium, which is where the spike in the blood pressure comes from. Um, so these people need to have lower, lower sodium, not buying low sodium products, but eating whole food and maybe using, you know, unrefined salt, like a Celtic sea salt or Himalayan salt. Um, and there is a predisposition to chronic kidney disease or kidney failure in these people with a lifetime of eating too much, too much salt. And I remember when I got that test back, I thought, oh, cause I never, I never tolerated salt. Um, and I tend to, I get easily get puffy under my eyes. And in Chinese medicine, that is a kidney weakness. Mm -hmm. And I always thought like, what? And, and if I do eat salt, I, I, I call it big face. Cause I get really, the next morning I can feel it. My face is really big. Yeah, if you have pickles, um, you have like pickle hands. Yeah. <laughs> Pickle hands. Pickle fingers. Um, and I and I remember thinking, that's so strange. There's no there's no kidney disease in my family. How where did I get this gene from? So um after having the test done, I actually asked my dad. And yeah, three of his relatives have died of kidney disease, and none of them even had diabetes, which is, you know, a huge predisposing factor to kidney disease. Yeah. Um and you know, so sometimes this uh Genetic testing for some people, like myself, uncovers these things that you didn't even know ran in your family. You know, up until, I don't know how long ago, what, 100 years ago, 70 years ago, people died sometimes of stuff and people weren't even sure what it was. Yeah, I think it also depends on how it's expressing because I have the ACE, I'm, uh, you know, homozygous for one of the ACEs and both my parents have high blood pressure. But because mm -hmm. I am homozygous, I'm not going to express that. Like, I'm not going to have high blood pressure as a result. I actually have low blood pressure. No matter what I do, I always have low blood pressure. So that's, there can be a, a yeah. good expression of that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so we touched on this a little bit already, but, um, you know, a lot of people are, are led to believe that certain mutations lead directly to disease. And certainly when you're studying the gene mutations, there's always a couple diseases associated with this mutation, how bad it is. And uh, depending on how bad it's expressing, you can have a worse form or a lesser form of the disease. But what's your take on that? Um, in terms of a gene leading to a disease? Yeah. Uh, well, no, because everything's, you know, uh, well, almost everything and most of the genes that are being tested for in these genetic panels that people are consulting on, they're all, they're all modifiable. Mm -hmm, yeah. Um, so like the, the ACE gene, for example, I don't have to have kidney disease. Nobody has to, have, you know, neither do you. But if yeah, I were to eat, let's say, salt and, a, 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 you know, what they call it standard American diet where, where everything is just loaded with salt, then yeah, I'm probably getting kidney disease. But without it, then no. And that's one of the great things. You know, a lot of these, these genes that they're putting into panels, they're not just finding genes and associating them with diseases and putting them into the panels. They're finding genes, seeing how they can be modified and what diseases they're associated with and what kind of modifications that creates. And then saying, hey, if you have this, you can do something about it. So you might want to test for it because then you can optimize around it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it's true. Like you're you're not a victim of your genes, your diet and lifestyle and other habits very, very much influence your, your genetics. So and I think many people know that they're aware of the, the science of epigenetics where we can turn we have the choice to turn our genes on and off. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um there's uh yeah, and once upon a time people thought um people thought that we were victims of our genes. Um, and sometimes I still, I'll still have patients that are going to be, you know, why would I test if there's nothing I can do? And I'm like, 
Ooh, have we not been talking? So sometimes people <laughs> need to break that, you know, break that um, that belief, which can be so so ingrained. You know, like, oh, I'm overweight. My whole family's overweight. Well, maybe they've got a gene. You know, there's actually a gene. Um, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it codes for amylase. You know, the enzyme in our saliva that breaks down carbs. Mm. And so um, it's one of the genes that they have something called copper no copy number variant. So not every gene has two parts that combine. That some genes have, it's called copper number variants, where you could have, you can have none. You could have one copy, you can have two copies, you can have three copies. So this gene for amylase, you can have up to 10 copies. And these are the people who, when they eat, let's say, rice or something starchy, um, it'll taste sweet in their mouth, which I actually didn't know that anyone tasted sweet in their mouth. So I guess I don't have a lot of copies of that. And a lot of Asian cultures, um, uh, in, in a lot of Asian cultures or East Asian cultures, people have a high number of copies of the um, gene that encodes for amylase. So they're really breaking the starch down really, really well in their mouth with the saliva. Um, and then the other thing that that often pairs with in a lot of people, it, well, a lot of people um, for, I guess, more, if you want to say traditional societies, um, is uh, re insulin receptors on their cells, lots of insulin receptors so that the carbohydrates get into their style, cells and don't stick around in, um, in the bloodstream to cause high blood sugar. And that's why some other people with, you know, a low number of copper um, copy number variants for the amylase enzyme won't break the starch down as well in their mouth and they get gassy and bloated because the the microbes uh, in their gut are breaking down what they didn't break down in their mouth um, and so they're not processing it as well yeah and that's why I, I love hearing things like this because if you know any of the listeners out there you're overweight and you're eating perfectly or what you think is perfectly and you're exercising and you're doing everything you can to lose weight sometimes there there's so many different factors that can negatively impact our waistline that have to do with our genetics that have to do with toxins in our body that have to do with copper dysregulation and other problems and so it's not you're not just uh, it's not just a problem with your willpower or with uh, the you're not trying hard enough uh, because uh, biology will always overcome willpower. So there are so many other things that you have to look into. And I'm actually writing a book about this uh, called the, the Roadblocks to Weight Loss. All the many different things, all the little mm -hmm. checklists you have to go through. And a lot of things that are not in typical weight loss books um, that you have to discern um, to find out. Sorry, my computer's going nuts. <laughs> to find uh -huh. out if uh, you do, uh, to find out all the, the roadblocks to weight loss that you may have. So just a you know tangent there. Uh, so don't give up hope. There's so many more things that, that uh, people can explore uh, when it has to do with, with weight loss, and it's not just diet and exercise. Yeah, it, it, and, that's, and that's the thing. That's a great – I love that you're writing that book because, um, yeah, there's often so many things that, and then people – get hard on themselves or they feel, you know, just really discouraged and they think there's something wrong with them or they hate their body, they think there's something wrong with their body, that it just doesn't work right. Um, and meanwhile, it's just something, let's say, you know, in their genetics or in their metabolism that's different than other people yeah. and it's not, and it's not being addressed and they, because they don't know about it. Let's talk about some of the uh, genetic direct-to-consumer testing out there. Uh, what are the, some of the testing places that you like? Um, you know what my favorite one is, actually? It's a company here in, um, I'm based out of Toronto, Canada, and it's a company here called Unique. Um, they're not as cheap as 23andMe, or not as inexpensive as 23andMe. They, uh, their testing is done at Sick Kids Hospital. I don't know if your viewers are familiar with that. Sick Kids has like a, at least among parents, has a, a world, uh, is world renowned. Um, it, so it's out of Sick Kids Hospital, University of Toronto. And the thing that I really like about them is that they do tons of research. They offer tons of support. Um, you need to go through, you do need to go for them through a practitioner to get it done. 
Um, but let's say you go to a practitioner and you get a, uh, a report done and, you know, there's just, there's so many combinations and there's so many variations between all the different genes. Um, and uh, it's not clear, let's say, to the practitioner because it is an emerging field. There's on, only so many experts in the world, really, right? So many people that are really, really, really well versed in this. So um, let's say they get the, the person's report back and it's just, it's not clear what the court, they can call the company because they're one of their customers and um, have a genetic consultation with one of the world's best experts. So I really, I, and they put out a lot of research and do a lot of um, practitioner support as well. So um, I'm, I'm heavily biased towards that because I, I feel that the interpretation of a genetic test is just as important or even more important as the test itself. If you can't interpret the information properly or you don't understand what you're looking at or it's stressing you out, um, then you're not, going to, you're not going to get that much from it. Um, I know 23andMe is, um, is really popular. Lots of people go through there and a lot of practitioners will send their patients, will send their patients through there as well. So it's not, ju it's not just a direct to consumer company either. Yeah. Yeah. I like to do that one. And then I have clients run it through an app. It's called, there's many apps, there's Gen Genetic Genie, and then there's uh, Sterling's app. And I like Sterling's app. I think it's one of the most up to date ones. And they've got uh, 50 pages. It gives you a 50 page report um, of all the, the health snips and things like that. Because unfortunately, 23andMe, they were kind of shut down by the FDA in reporting, giving health reports. So if you go yeah. there, you can only get ancestral reports, which is interesting. You know, I found out I'm 60% yeah. British. <laughs> I thought I was more German, but I guess not. Um, only nine percent German. It makes me kind of sad. But uh. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So you run into this Sterling Zap, and it's like thirty dollars, not expensive, and you can find out a lot of information. Um, of course, you still need to have a professional look it over. It really doesn't give you a, a, a lot of information, if any information at all, um, as a layperson. But you do definitely have to have it interpreted. Yeah, because it's not like we said before, it's not like a plug and play type of thing where you have this gene, it means this, you got this, it means this. they're all not independent. The way that they, you know, weave together yeah. makes, uh, makes a difference. So I think as a, uh, as a practitioner, getting that information um, is, is really helpful. But yeah, as a lay person, it's not going to, it's really not going to tell you that much or enough to interpret what's going on. Yeah, and I forgot to mention you can go to Sterling Zap and run your raw data, 23andMe data through mthfrsupport.com. That's where you find mm. that. And yes. hopefully the owner of that, her name is Sterling Hill. Hopefully I'm going to be getting her on the podcast soon. Uh, oh, talk, fantastic. Talk more about genetics because it's so interesting. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about uh, what can be done with some different profiles, say, uh, you know, behavioral, for instance. All right, so behavioral. Um, you know, there's methylators are great, things like SAMI, even B12 folic acid, but those can also overstimulate people. So one of my favorite things to do to, let's say, to calm down a behavioral profile where people are overstimulated um, is meditation, mm -hmm. um, especially for, you know, that, that 5-HTTLPR gene where people are putting out extra stress hormone in response to stressful situations. Meditation has been shown to, to decrease how much stress hormone goes out. And the other thing that I like about if someone is uh, slow on COMT or slow comped, you know, it is, it breaks down dopamine slowly. So if you put out less dopamine, you put out less adrenaline, there's less there to be broken down slowly. So it's, it's preemptive. Mm. Um, one problem, uh, and, and Sa Sammy works great as well. Sammy actually speeds up the COMT enzyme, it uses a lot of magnesium. And I know I was having a problem with one of my patients where I would give her Sammy and she's like, oh, I feel so much calmer. It's great. And then she was having all these foot cramps. And we were try I was trying to replenish her magnesium and she would be fabulous. And the second I gave her Sammy, she would have foot cramps again. So we just switched over to meditation and, and, and she's doing great. So that can be uh, that can be really helpful as well. Um, let's see some of the other behavioral There's detoxification. Um, detoxification. Ah, yeah. So 
my favorite thing to do for the DJ, I mean, turmeric is great for um, slowing down phase one. So you don't want phase one to be too fast. Again, it produces all those toxic intermediates. So turmeric or curcumin is probably one of the best ways to slow down slow down phase one. I also really like adding in um, adding in phase two support and things like um, broccoli sprouts support phase two, um, selenium, glutathione, glycine. There's some um, uh, detox protein shakes that support phase two that I really that I really really love to use. Um, not everyone will necessarily you don't want to take like oh here are these five nutrients um, speed up phase two and you're taking a handful of pills for this one this one thing so sometimes a detox protein shake um, that I'll use when I do detox with patients but sometimes I'll also with with patients with a slow phase two um, I'll just have them do a scoop or two a day as their snacks as an, on an ongoing basis and most people are so busy today that having a, a protein shake uh, to use as one of their snacks throughout the day or every other day, something like that. Most people I find are pretty, um, are pretty happy with that. They can just add water, shake it up and, and keep going on with their day. Yeah, and so what about uh, some of the uh, hormonal profiles? The hormonal profiles. Um, yeah, the glutathione is good, uh, calcium glucurate, helps to um, improve, uh, improve estrogen metabolism. You know, anything that also reduces the amount of free radicals you produce, so anything that also overall reduces your toxins, you need to use less of your SOD enzymes to neutralize the free radicals in those toxins. So there's more SOD enzyme to address the free radicals produced by estrogen metabolism, um, taking the pressure off your COMPT or COMT enzyme is also, um, it's in another indirect way, but it's a great way because the COMT also breaks down, also is active at a couple of places in the estrogen um, metabolic pathways. And when it comes in, it makes, you know, it makes things better. It, it, it diverts um, the estrogen metabolism away from some of the more, um, uh, uh, more undesirable, undesirable end products. So, um, you know, the same things that I mentioned, mentioned for COMT and reducing toxins, SAMI, um, uh, activated B12, activated, activated folic acid, um, meditation, you know, so decreasing the amount of dopamine and adrenaline that COMT needs to break down, freeze more of it up to work to work with those estrogen pathways as well, um, and another thing, it's not quite genetically related, but it's I mean, but it but it's important is for estrogen metabolism that um, women are having proper bowel movements because you reabsorb estrogen if you're constipated or if your bowels. There's actually a bacteria in our gut. You know, our liver conjugates estrogen, so it attaches something to estrogen, so you can eliminate it, and you're not going to reabsorb it when it's conjugated. Um, and, uh, if it's sitting in your gut because you're not having good bowel movements, then there's an, uh, bacteria that unconjugates, it just takes that part off and you reabsorb it and it's active estrogen. So, you know, probiotics and, um, and, and, and one thing I just want to add, it's a little off topic, is if you eat every day, you should poop every day. Yeah. You know, some people will say, oh, it's just normal for my body, my doctor said, once every other day or twice a week. No, it's not. No, no, yeah. it's absolutely not. Yeah, you need to be aiming to win those poop pageants for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, did you want to add anything? Sorry. <laughs> sorry, no, it's okay. I, I love it. Yeah, third grade humor just never gets old, does it? Yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that before, actually, poop pageant. <laughs> yeah. That's from uh, Diane Sanfilippo. She uh, invented that. Um, or not, she didn't invent it, but she made it very popular among the paleo crowd. Excellent. Yeah, <laughs> the pooping paleo crowd. Um, Wonderful. So uh, let's talk about the king mother of the genes, the MTHFR. Ah, yes. Um, and it's, uh, it's an important test because 50% of people have at least one allele in, in this SNP. Uh, can you talk a little yeah. bit about MTHFR? 
Yeah, so MTHFR, I was actually just interviewing Colleen Walsh the other day, and she had a great explanation for it. You know, MTHFR is like the, the mama bear of this whole pathway called methylation. And the methylation pathway is, and this, this is Colleen's analogy, like the Olympic rings. You know, there's like these four rings and they intertwine and everything's connected to everything. But the MTHFR one is kind of sits right in the middle. And there's a lot of things that people with, um, so about 30, um, or if you have one uh, MTHFR, if, if one of the alleles is um, less desirable, you make 30% uh, less methyl, what they call methyl factors. And if you've got both of them, you can make up to 70%. And I've even seen some numbers that go a little higher less methyl factors. And these methyl factors are important for so many things. It's, uh, it's absolutely incredible. They're important for hormone balance. They're important for mood. Um, it, you know, it messes with, you can mess with your serotonin, your dopamine, adrenaline. Um, they're important for detox, important for elimination of heavy metals, um, uh, energy production. Uh, it's associated with autism, allergies, asthma, you know, again, anxiety, depression. The list of things that MTHFR um, uh, abnormalities, if you want to call it that, are associated with is it's, it's one of those lists that's just so long that there's very few things that are not on the list. It's associated with um, higher cholesterol levels and higher homocysteine levels. So sometimes people who have um, uh, familial, you know, a, a family history of cardiovascular disease, family history of high cholesterol, the MTHFR can be an issue. It's associated with infertility or recurrent miscarriage. And some, sometimes some women who just, they're, they're, again, they're not getting pregnant and there doesn't seem to be any reason why there can be an MTHFR problem there as well. Um, and then they're taking folic acid like it's going out of style. Yeah. Which promotes all, more problems. Yeah, and all the folic acid in, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that, all the folic acid in, um, you know, a regular supplement, a multivitamin, and the prenatals, um, the folic acid that's in um, fortified grains and cereals and breads and blah, 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 like everywhere you see the word, it's all synthetic folic acid. And it, our body doesn't use it nearly as well as natural folic acid, which you get, one of the big places is uh, like raw, raw leafy greens, um, but you can also buy activated folic acid. And that's where you wanna, if you do have that problem, that's where you wanna have someone prescribe it to you because it can get a little funny. Like sometimes people can take folic acid and get overstimulated and they can get anxious or they can get depressed. Um, ben Lynch is a big MTHFR guy and I, I've seen some case studies of his saying, you know, he put a kid on B12, activated B12 and folic acid, and it was too much for them. And they flew into a rage, and they were breaking walls at home, just crazy things. And then he would adjust their protocol, and they would calm down. So that's not really something to, to fiddle around too much um, by yeah, yourself. I th yeah, I think if people have anxiety issues, they really need to be careful about the methylated Bs. Uh, for sure, yeah. and be very, uh, you know, titrate up, be very, very careful when taking that, take small doses to start, and then, uh, you know, see how you feel, see what, uh, you know, symptoms that manifest after taking it. Yeah, and, and getting the, the um, and getting the synthetic folic acid out, you know, which, which really just converts people to a whole foods diet, you know, getting away from fortified stuff and cereals with all the synthetic B vitamins added. Um, I like to tell patients that if you see a product and it has vitamins added, basically what they're saying is our product had so little nutritional value that we added synthetic vitamins. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't you want to buy it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so and let that be a red flag. Just stay away. Yeah, and it's an MTHFR. It's an inability to convert folic acid to the active methylated form. Correct. Yeah, and so it it um, so it stops that pathway because the folic acid goes down. It gets converted to methyl methyl um, methyl tetrahydrofolic acid, and then you know it's go it's going through the pathway and donate. And the methyl groups pass around like a baton in a race. You know, the baton keeps getting passed around, so the race keeps going. But if, you're, if your folic acid can't get through, because you don't have that enzyme, well, then it just stops. 
and people tend to be deficient in these in these methyl factors where that's where the hormones get out of balance, the immune system can get out of balance, cholesterol can because the methyl groups are just used for so many reactions and if there's not enough of them there, all kinds of things either start, you know, slowing down or grinding to a halt, not going well. And people, it's also associated with fibromyalgia. Sorry, that's another big one. Um, and often a lot of people with fibromyalgia, with MTHFR, just feel like everything's going wrong. And a, one big reason for that is often that uh, a lot of things are going wrong because there's not enough methyl factors in all these different, all these different locations. Um, another thing that uh, people with uh, the MTHFR gene often have a problem with is gluten and dairy. Mm. You know, I think, and I think a lot of people who tune into health information like this um, are often people who have problems with gluten or dairy, or you know, health problems, fibromyalgia, things like that. So I could imagine that among your listener base, the incidence of an MTHFR problem is probably much higher than fifty percent. Yeah, I'm just yeah, guessing. definitely. Yeah. Anyone with a, a chronic health condition probably need to eliminate gluten and dairy. Yeah, and uh, and uh, getting your MTHFR checked out is always a good idea as well because. Um, I know you're um, big on on minerals and heavy metal detox, um, and you know again these people aren't going to be able to detox their metals very well. Um, autoimmune disease is another one with uh, MTHFR, a big predisposing factor. And I had a patient the other day um, who's a, rheum a new patient with rheumatoid arthritis, and her chiropractor told her, you know, you should go get lymphatic massage, and. Um, so she's just new like two days ago, so I don't know her MTH of our status yet, but um, she was sick for weeks afterwards. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's another um, a clue for a lot of people that have MTHFR problems is they, they may, I mean, there can be other issues as well with the, you know, the SIP enzymes that we talked about, but um, they often don't handle detox well. So these people may take some milk thistle, you know, do a detox from the store, um, and their skin goes insane and just doesn't get better. Or they feel sick, and the detox reaction that's supposed to last, you know, 24 to 48 hours doesn't go away after days and days and weeks, and then they give up on the cleanse. And someone says, no, you shouldn't have given up. It was going to go away. Um, and these people usually know that, Something's off. Something just doesn't. I don't respond well to that, but I don't know why not. And that can be an MTHFR issue as well. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about methylation? What exactly is methylation for any of the listeners that don't know what that is? Ah, uh, yeah. So methylation uh, or the methylation cycle is this big or this big web-like pathway in our system where these, um, I like to call them M factors to make it easy, but where these little methyl groups get passed around. They just get shunted around to all these different, um, all these different uh, hormones and components of these pathways that make up our neurotransmitters, that make up our hormones, that make up our cholesterol cycle. Um, they, they do other things too. They can, what they call methylate our genes. So if it, when it, often when a gene is methylated, it's turned off. So that's why, you know, you talk about how stress, uh, or actually we haven't talked about it today, but stress can turn genes on. So sometimes people will have a genetic issue, um, but they're like, you know, I didn't have this five or 10 years ago. And when you go through a period of stress, it can be turned on. But um, when we talk about genes being turned off, let's say the 5-HTT LPR example where people meditate and they respond more like someone who doesn't have the S allele that makes them have a higher stress response. When they go in and look at these people's genes, let's say, the, let's say they're LS, the S will be methylated. So it'll be covered by these methyl factors and your body can't use it when it's covered with methyl factors. So... Um, so they do that as well. Um, so yeah, it's passed around through these pathways. So the way your body recycles hormones and neurotransmitters and produces them and um, just kind of shunts these things around, for lack of a better term. Um, in order for all of these pathways to keep going, you need methyl factors at so many, so many different points. 
Um, and when you, again, when you don't get these methyl factors, you know, a great example is cholesterol. Homocysteine builds up, cholesterol builds up because you're not recycling your cholesterol properly. You're not recycling your homocysteine properly. Um, is that clear? That was very clear. That was a very good okay, explanation. Good. <laughs> it's, been a, it's, it's been a long day. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's very, very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so I have a question that I like to ask all of my guests. What yes. do you think is the most pressing health issue in the world today? Ah, wow. Okay. Um, what do I think is the most pressing health issue in the world today? I would say... I would say that people aren't taking care of themselves. A lot of people, um, a lot of people are crisis-minded. You know, they go to the doctor when there's something wrong, versus prevention-minded. That's what I mean by not taking care of themselves. Um, and because if you're prevention-minded, you know, we're all so different. So for some people, the toxins in our environment and in our products are what's basically killing them. And when they eliminate the toxins, their whole world changes. And for other people, um, stress is killing them. And when they meditate or, you know, they use nutrient, brain nutrients to help calm themselves down, their whole life changes. Um, and, and I guess if we had a different conversation about stress and GMOs and food and all these different things, I would say that each one was the worst problem. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's the the lack of um, and problems once they once they come up and and what I call crisis control. So you did a summit called the Lifestyle is New Medicine Summit, and you're yes. very gracious to ask me to speak in the summit. I was very, very happy to contribute. Uh, so why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about the summit and when it starts, et cetera. Yeah, and it was so wonderful to have you on the summit. So your interview goes live on the second day. The summit starts tomorrow. The summit starts May 7th. And uh, your interview, Wendy, is going live on May the 8th. And uh, I call that lifestyle is the new medicine because really how we live and the choices we make every day is, at the end of the day, what determines our health. And, and, and like I said, I see such a, such a lack of prevention. I want to educate people around, um, around living, living the kind of lifestyle. I, my, my little thing at the beginning of each interview is living the kind of lifestyle that supports you to be vibrantly healthy so you can get the most out of life. And that's, and that's really what it is. You know, when you're not healthy, when you're not feeling good, vibrant, energetic, um, you can't get the most out of life if you're anxious, depressed, exhausted, you know, focused all day long on how bloated and uncomfortable you feel in your pants. You're not really <laughs> able to fully engage with life and what's going on. Um, so the the food we eat, the exercise we do, our mindset, how we manage our stress, the toxins in our environments, what we do with our adrenals, um, what foods we eat or don't eat, uh, really feeds into our quality of life in such a way that it it shapes our life. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was really happy to par participate in the summit. I spoke about food sensitivities and how those yes. dramatically impact our health and promote inflammation and you know, how to discover your food sensitivities. I think it's very very important for anyone that is uh, seeking health to test for food sensitivities and eliminate those foods. Uh, so check, tune into the summit. It's a, an amazing summit, amazing lineup of speakers. Um, and so check it out. Uh, so wanting to the listeners a little bit about yourself and uh, you know in your website. Yeah, so uh, my website for the summit is lifestyleisthenewmedicine.com. And uh, my website outside of that is called themindbodydoctor.com. And um, one of the things I found more and more is that, you know, naturopathic medicine seems to be veering more towards, you know, supplements and protocols and things like that. And, and I like to do that with, with patients, but I also really like to incorporate the mind-body approach. And I think that really rounds out, rounds out the lifestyle concept. You know, for all the people who 
do amazing exercise and they're fit and they eat healthy, but they're miserable or they're angry or they're, you know, they're, they're stressed out and run down. Um, that's not any better than just being miserable and stressed out and run down. Um, so I, I take the approach of, um, I take the approach of really looking at everything, you know, how are you sleeping? How's your energy? What are you eating? Um, how stressed are you? What's your mood like? And, uh, and, and then I like to go in and look at all of that, look at all of that foundational stuff. And if people are eating well, but they're not, they're not sleeping well, then I'll address that first. Or, you know, I really like getting people on, um, whole foods, you know, the, real food movement. I really like getting people on that. And I don't know if that's because I'm a naturopath or um, I'm half Italian. So my mom was Italian. So we were raised <laughs> very much that way. I mean, my parents would not even order pizza on my birthday. My dad was like, no, I'm making pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so I know you couldn't go to Chuck E. Cheese. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I went for other kids' birthdays, but for mine, like absolutely not. My dad would sooner make six pizzas for all my friends then order a pizza. Yeah. Um, so I really grew up with that. You know, if you want something, you just make it. And as a kid, I hated it because all my friends, you know, bought stuff out and I wanted to too. Um, and then as I got older, I was like, oh, no, this is just the way life is. Um, so really coming from that, uh, that holistic, um, you know, eat real food and nurture your relationships and look at your stress level and make sure that you're doing all of the foundational things, the lifestyle, versus trying to use pills to compensate for your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I love it when I uh, have doctors like yourself on the show, and they're tending to functional medicine, and they are talking to their clients or patients about diet and lifestyle, et cetera, because that's where that's what you have to focus on if you're going to get uh, your patients better. So I, I love interviewing doctors like yourself, and I uh, think you're the wave of the future, the conventional medicine. It's going to go to the wayside because people are waking up. They are getting a clue that drugs yeah. and surgery by themselves aren't working and only serve to make sicker people, people faster. Um, so thank you so much for what you're doing. Oh, thanks so much, Wendy. <laughs> and thanks for coming on the show. And listeners, if you want to learn more about me, you can go to liveto110.com. You can learn about detoxification and how to heal your health conditions naturally and about my version of paleo, the modern paleo diet. So please go check out my new online health program that's just launched a few days ago, bodybiorehab.com, where you can lose 10 pounds in 30 days. I've got a four-week four meal plan and lots of fun stuff in the program. And thank you so much for listening to the Live to 110 podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Wendy. Bye-bye. Bye. How you got into methylation and genetics, et cetera, and your website. Well, I've been a health practitioner for the past decade, and I have developed an entirely web-based nutritional consulting practice. I am the CEO and founder of Metabolic Healing, Inc., and our website is www.metabolichealing.com. And we work with a variety of different types of clients. We have clients that are very sick with chronic illness, chronic fatigue, adrenal and endocrine problems, methylation dysfunction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we found that there's definitely an integrated approach that can be used when helping to deal with a lot of these types of issues. And uh, we've been doing this for several years now, and we've focused a lot of our attention in the last few years specifically on individuals who have problems with methylation in particular. And oftentimes these kinds of problems manifest with certain symptoms such as chronic fatigue, autoimmune problems such as Hashimoto's thyroiditis, other types of chronic gastrointestinal inflammatory problems, cardiovascular disease, especially if there's a familial risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, so a lot of these issues overlap. Not surprisingly, once you start realizing that the methylation cycle is directly related to each of these types of problems. Yeah, I just, in, being a health practitioner myself, uh, I decided that I had to add genetics and methylation to my practice because it dramatically uh, affects people's health outcomes and their ability to detox and so many factors can be affected by this and you can't really help people unless you're, you're uh, you know, 
uh, attending to these uh, these health issues. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what exactly is methylation for anyone that doesn't know what that is. So methylation is it's actually a biochemical pathway that's happening in every cell of the body, some, something like a billion times per second in every cell of the body. You could think that that's quite a dance of activity. And the methylation cycle, it is so interconnected with so many things that the body does from heart health, cardiovascular health, to endocrine function, to uh, neurotransmitters, so affecting mood and behavior. A lot of people with anxiety and depression and bipolar disorder have problems methylating. Um, so methylation is tied to so many different things. And uh, it's, it's a, as I said, it's a biochemical pathway that's going on in the body continuously. And we'll talk about genetics and the possible interaction that certain genes have on the methylation cycle. But methylation has gotten a lot of attention over recent years because there's so much scientific studies and literature that has been done on methylation, particularly regarding all of these types of health problems that we're seeing in the 21st century here. 